Okay. I hope this time the sharing my screen is. I can share my screen because last time it was not working at all. I'll, I will share the link to. Yeah, it works. Yeah, we can see it. <laughs> Wonderful. And I will try to still see your faces. Oosh. No. Yeah, I can yeah. see if you like uh, play full screen, it kind of sets us apart on a. Oh, really? Yeah. Like I just press full screen. Oh, you, that's that's a shame. You know better than me. <laughs> I no, should I just be aware of this. By mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Okay. And I will share the um, in the chat the link as well. To be fair, I'm, I'm actually using Google Chrome as a browser when I, we're talking, when we come on Kumo, because my Brave browser eats my CPU, it eats my laptop to the core. So I always have it uh, saved, even the mirror board. Yeah, uh, well, I have the same issue. And even with Chrome, is um, it's, <laughs> it's not so, you know, it's not so... Um, nice and the cpu as well because i i am I'm, I'm right now i'm in the the kumo space i have like several tabs in my browser open at, as well in a separate screen and i'm recording this screen where i see your faces uh at the same time and sometimes it's just <clears throat> yeah it's it's telling me that it's too much for for the computer <laughs> yeah Okay, so we said failure. Are we still okay with with that? I think Smart Mark it's please. yeah. I think Mark it's you who came with this, or it was crazy cra during why, the. Why not? Yeah, I think why not? Cameron, he ditched us now. <laughs> he left us talk about failure. He failed to appear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. You know, it's weird the way sometimes uh, it cuts the words, like failure, mm -hmm. e. puts uh, some kind of, um, you know, uncertainty in the, <laughs> in the, in the, in the meaning of the word. That's, <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. Mm. So, what is failure? Yeah, that's a good question. What comes in mind? I think there's something related to um, um, losing something. Like, I, I feel like when we we speak about failure, this component of, uh, you know, losing about something, <clears throat> even though you can say it's, a, you know, you learn, but you learn because you, you lost something in the process, right? So you, you, now, you know, Yeah, when something doesn't perform as it's expected to, I guess. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, it, failure is preceded by action, mm -hmm. right? I think is is one of the things that you don't. That's that whole like. <clears throat> was it you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take? Kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so there is a, there's a, there's a component to it that there is some kind of attempt at something, even, even in like, 
like or, uh, like structural engineering terms if a bridge fails, you know, there was an attempt to span some kind of gap and that in the end is the intent of that thing and then that thing fails to perform that purpose, whether immediately or over time or <coughs> something like that. So it's the it's the the undoing of some kind of attempt to achieve something. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, it requires that thing to have been attempted. Yes. So another way of looking at it, I mean, more simplistically, but from a design perspective, when you design something that fails, it means it's not working. Most commonly, I guess. Mm hmm. Yeah, and at the same time, you could say that you, okay, so I would say there's, um, there's context in, in failure, right? And, and the fact is that sometimes you, you, you create something for, you know, knowing that it will fail, probably fail, right? So you this is the point of playing with probabilities in that sense that you you know that it's a probability that you fail and so we can uh, include that in the process right <clears throat> and there is this notion of um not really planning for that or not expecting that like in the the, the engineering type of approach <clears throat> you could say that if you design a bridge, uh, you don't want it to fail at some point, right? You you design it to not fail because it's uh, not really good. If <laughs> the, with the Second World War with the airplanes, you know the the fact that they did this like mapping of. Uh, airplanes that were like you know getting shot and yes. they were taking this data and like okay and we need to reinforce all these places that they've been shot so you know they they will last longer but it came with a lot of problems because they were trying to design for failure but if they truly wanted to design for success they needed to reinforce the bits that could function you know regardless of uh Kind of getting shot because these planes that were coming they were actually making it back home they mm -hmm. were the planes that made it it wasn't a map of the planes that just landed and crashed because of the the bullets so it, it's a very interesting way of how do you actually design do you design for failure or for success do you design mm -hmm. to just yeah resist like if a bridge is designed to not fail I think it will cause a lot of tension and stress when you walk on yeah. it because you're praying for it doesn't fail. Doesn't well, fail. <clears throat> yeah, I think we could say that now we we design it to fail in a certain way. We would design today a bridge to fail in a certain way that causes the least damages or the least chance of hurting people, something like that. We know it's a possibility that the bridge fell, so it's meant to do it to do so in a certain way. And it, it's like with a car. When you have a crash, you know the exterior of the car is meant to bend and absorb the, the impact in a certain way that saves life, right? But uh, what you what you mentioned <laughs> earlier with the the um, the planes in, during the World War Two, it, it's called now a, it's a bias. It's called the survivorship bias yeah. because of that. Because uh, you 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 diminish the um, the the importance of the fact that what came what those planes that came back came back, and therefore those are not the one that you should look at. You know you should look for. The, the one that never came back because those those are the one that display what is really the failure in the fact that they they didn't made a, the made the, the the return right 
Isn't that point to another thing, which is like, how obvious is failure? Sometimes mm. it takes ages to realize that we, have failed. we are doing something that causes, you know, mm-hmm. more damage than mm-hmm. we hoped. So failure doesn't seem to be so in the face. You know, there's one thing to be like in a competition and be like, okay, you, you fail to take, to perform and we'll go to take third place. And there's another thing to actually measure it. How do you actually measure failure? Mm-hmm. By damage caused subjectively, you know, if I feel like I'm a failure, I get a lot of people, you know, even I thought for a very long time as an angry teenager that I feel like a failure. Mm-hmm. So what is this feeling? What does it actually mean? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think for measuring failure, the first the first thing to to do is just just to to speak about what could be elements of failure, what could be the the, the thing that are obvious, but they are so obvious that we never you know speak about it. So you know. Sometimes when you you are in those projects where it's already hard for people to define what could be to define success, right? We we should then take time to define as well what could be the opposite of that, what could be the elements of, of failure that we can just think of uh, by ourselves, and then <clears throat> you can find you know, instruments to, to measure that, that's for you. But if you never talk about this, you, you are unable to, to rego- recognize what could, what could fail in your pro- in your design. I mean, the other thing too is the the fact that when an artifact is created, it tends to need to work in multiple ways, right? That you can, so a bridge, the the intention of a bridge might be to lower uh, traffic volume on another bridge or something like that, right? So what could happen is that it actually doesn't because more people take their cars and therefore now you have two bridges that are clogged up instead of just the one. Mm -hmm. And so in a way you have to ask, you know, is that failure, right? So there are the bridge failing in terms of falling into the water and collapsing, or there's the fact that there was some intention for the bridge that um, that this was the wrong solution to that problem or something like that, which would also make it a failure. So there are different ways that things can fail and they're not all, they're not always obvious, right? That there are second order failures or unintended consequences to, to things. And I think we have to put that, we need to, we need to allow for that or allow for that in the conversation. Mm-hmm. I.e. failure is not always obvious. <laughs> yeah, and what we we think as uh, elements of success could be success for, as you mentioned, as uh, what could be success right now could could be you know what generates the failure in the long in the long term. Term, you know, it's it's like you you have this uh, this kind of uh, ripple effect, like th- this idea of you know some you know some. Decades ago, I think it's in the U.S. They, <clears throat> they, or I think it's it's still done as as such today. <laughs> Might be wrong, but uh, you know, with um, traffic jam in, in main highways, 
they they said okay we, we want to fix this issue so we increase the number of uh, of uh, lanes oh, available yeah. and then you create you, yeah for a while you fix the issue right so it's a success you now have more lanes therefore you there's for the same a- amount of cars now you fix the issue now it, there's no more traffic jam but as, but you know soon after that they realized that it created demands as there were more lanes and less traffic, they realized that the people realized that they could take the car. People that were not taking the car before now realize they can take their car to go to work and it's way faster than other options. And and now you create demands. More people want to take the, the car to to go to work. And uh, and in a few months is the traffic are worse than before the the, the design change and and I think it's a really interesting kind of way to look at it as a success that becomes uh, a failure because by the initial criteria it was a success mm-hmm. right yeah exactly <clears throat> I mean they did that in, in Montreal when I was younger I don't know what the traffic's like there now but mm. I mean I used to change my behavior in that I made sure I was on the road before seven because quarter after seven was the beginning of traffic. They then said that they were going to fix the highway and the city was up in arms or the people in the city were up in arms because they said, well, they're not going to expand it. They're just going to fix it. Mm. Right? So they're not adding any other lanes. But in the end, it ended up being the right thing to do. Somebody was kind of thinking ahead because otherwise what would have happened is, you know, people, people like me who are leaving before seven <clears throat> would have said, well, now I can make it at 7.15, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and so you would have had, Maybe not even more cars on the road, but more cars at the same time. <clears throat> so, yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah. Um, I think the other thing, too, that was interesting, and I mean, there was a, in the startup community, whatever, I mean, what, 15 years ago now, I remember there was this whole thing about failing fast, right? Fail mm-hmm. fast, fail fast. And then kind of like, you know, move fast and break things and and that kind of approach and i can't remember who it was that pointed it out but they were like it's gotten so bad that people forget that the goal is actually success and not failure (laughs) that 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 it is not like (laughs) that you that we that we are celebrating failure too much and we are not celebrating success enough and that and that that was at the time like i don't Mm. know exactly what the thinking on it is now but i remember there was this because there were all these failure wakes and people kind of celebrating their their failures and how much they've learned you know but you know you 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 fail enough and your startup goes nowhere yeah right so 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 failure is not the goal it just fear of failure just shouldn't be a deterrent and i think those are subtly different things yeah Well, but maybe there's a, a confusion there as well that's in this idea of, you know, failing, uh, failure and fail often and stuff like that. The idea is, one, one of the issue with that as well is like, you don't look for the consequences of the failure, right? Mm-hmm. Because you want to avoid this fear of failure. But because of that, we can see as well, like some some companies did, you know, some some you know worse than anything else by applying this kind of philosophy of moving forward no matter what, because what what the importance is in you know this process of trying stuff and don't really caring for the actual consequences of those things as soon as they don't meet the initial criteria that they they had. And sometimes the in the you know this is this idea of actually learning from the failure, not only in uh, um in the um, the design criteria, but how do you measure as well the way you succeed and fail, right? So it's not just uh, if you just redefine the, let's say, a product around the same initial criteria, and you just say, "Oh, it's a matter of tweaking 
those things, right? You're just ending up trying a lot of things and maybe causing more harm than actually, you know, solving solving anything. And yeah, this those are tightly linked. Like, how do you design what you are trying to design? But how do you measure? And how far do you look for those elements, you know, and actually redefining them. I mean, I know that <coughs> people who, the fact that we talk to our clients about success is often something they comment on that other designers don't do. That design gets away with the fuzziness of, you know, if you don't set a success metric, it is very difficult to fail, right? It's difficult yeah. to succeed, but it's difficult to fail. And, you know, if we are, if we tend towards loss aversion, failing, is worse than not succeeding, right? Mm. Essentially. And so I do think that there is a, that there has for a long time, at least in graphic design and some other things, <clears throat> some other kind of ranges of design discipline that you, that the aesthetic outcome is enough and the second order effect of whatever it is that you've done isn't as important. And that's one of the things that I think is a general criticism of design that is aesthetically, mm -hmm. you know, focused. Yeah. Um, I tend to be, I tend to be careful with that because I think that things need to be well executed to be successful. Right. I mean, from mm -hmm. a graphic point of view, that things that, you know, are, um, things that are poorly executed tend not to work except in some extreme circumstances like, what was it? Um, was it eBay? No, not eBay. Craigslist. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, it's just like, like I think there are, there are these like fringe examples where somehow there is there's an an appropriateness to the response and a certain mm. you know like acclimatization of the audience that then it kind of works after a while. They kind of yeah. like like it finds its groove. And I find that really interesting, but for the most part, things that are interesting and unique and appropriate to the message tend to do better than things that are not. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think you, you can fail on an aesthetic basis, but I think there's usually some second order thing that you're trying to achieve beyond looking pretty. Well, on that, on that point, I, I would be, I, I don't know. Uh, personally, I, I really don't know. To me, there's two two things. First, uh, the initial network you are starting with, like Craigslist was for, uh, it, it it started in a certain community that were not looking for you know, aesthetics as a, a primary you know element. First of all, and 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 they were used to like they were geeks and the geeks the kind of geeks that from the early you know, uh, internet thing right. So, uh, it. it I do, I do feel like they were way worse <laughs> actually on the web at this time. And uh, it was more about what, um, what it allowed them to do than, mm. you know, the look of it. So I, I would say you can start with something not necessarily, you know, pleasing, but that functionally works and that does the job for 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 a certain group in the community, but then as soon as you want to extend, you need something more that that you know that as well that cover that that parts as well. So you you need a two, and this is where my second point is that it's more like um you know that we, we sometimes we speak about placebo effect, and the, the real name for that for that is uh, context uh, contextual effects, and what it says is basically you know when uh you you say with some someone say oh i i started to eat only uh salads 
uh, at lunch and I lose, I don't know, 20, I don't know, <laughs> 20 kilo. Uh, usually you reduce the, 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 um, the situation to one event that uh, does not properly reflect all the context that goes with it. Because probably when you started to do that, that thing, that particular thing, you started to do as well other things like doing more often, you know, sports and uh, taking care of what you eat in general and stopping to eat other things that were, you know, not not so good for you. So there's a, a lot of things that we say, contextual effects, you know, that causes this kind of uh, results. And this is exactly the same thing with, with design, right? You, you When you add up all the things that goes with it, 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 it kind of helps the the... the increases the chances of the of, of the outcomes we want to see and uh, reducing the discussion and this is where it's really tricky to discuss this kind of thing in general with the design committees reducing the the discussion uh, on aesthetics alone is missing the point right because it's not just just that part it's just how how it comes with the rest of the, the of the work and the thing that you need to do in order to increase the chances of success and and that's the kind of you know difficult part of the discussion i'd say yeah I, I don't i don't disagree with that at all i think that's that's absolutely right i mean i think you know good design can do things like bring clarity and legibility to the you know to the content or mm. help direct to certain actions or help clarify what's available or make the process of manipulating whatever objects that you need to manipulate easier right or like purchasing a car or finding a car something like that yes. no it's it's entirely together i think my my point was is that you know you could have something that succeeds functionally but fails aesthetically and that actually is kind yes. of a that, that's a really interesting there's a like is there like an overall point scoring system for success right <laughs> Yeah, like, like, how do you, you know, how do you, and, and that, that then becomes a matter of um, your frame in terms of criticism. Yes. Right. Because failure is also, I think, to some degree subjective, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, some people, and that's why I think I put like, you know, success at whose expense, mm -hmm. right? Like, like it can be successful in one sense, but fail society, right? <laughs> like, yes. Yes, that's right. And yeah, it goes along with this idea of uh, who you do you start with as a first of a first network, and then how do you extend this, you know, the reach of your of what you 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 try to do to a broad, you know, to a, a broader network. You can tell we can speak about Facebook as a good example of something that was not so pretty at the beginning, but had a, a lot of success, right? Mm -hmm. Because even for the the standards of of that of the time, it was not so pretty. It was kind of you know average something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And it was not the point of of it to be necessarily you know uh, pretty at all. So, but yeah. now they extend it to to, to the, the entire world the, you need to make it you know like. It's now we could say it's average for many standards. You know, it's average, and it, that it did not, it it does not everything in a, a good way. Uh, and we can talk about we can talk about success and failure there as well. You could say, yeah, from a, a business point of view, it's a success. For a social point of view, it's <laughs> it's questionable, right? So yeah, but it takes a lot of hard thinking to actually note this kind of failure because it's so, you know, subtle, mm. at least at the beginning, it was very subtle until someone actually pointed it out. And, uh, and I think it, it kind of it digresses into this failure to address the cause or yes. the cause of failure, you know, this dichotomy between the two. Yeah. It, it also points to the fact that you, that there has to be intention. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Prior to it, right? Like that. 
yeah, and but I think you know with the, with the intent, it's it's a bit tricky because you can have it on a conscious level, but actually the way you are built and the way you think about the world can set you to fail right from the beginning, despite your best intentions. I remember this thing from the social dilemma when they were like talking about, oh, we put the like button, and we thought this is going to be the most positive thing in the world, everyone's going to love it. But then, you know, this superficiality and fear of mm -hmm. failing in a, on a social platform of showing this negative side, you're actually heightening the, the problem itself that comes around it if, because you don't give it space to develop mm -hmm. or creating space for, for, for it to fail, pretty much. Yeah, that, that points as well to the, to the, like, the question I, I'm asking there. It's like, if face, Facebook is as successful in terms of, or, you know, other type of uh, social networks are successful in terms of business and they are not in terms of society, is it a failure of the business of the company that created those solutions or um, like the, you know, the systems that allows or that sets the rules for this kind of business to exist in, in the first place, right? So, so it, it brings as well the question of the, to whom is it a failure? And if, if, yeah. if we say, okay, for, for society, it's a failure, then what, what is the, um, the elements that allows the society that, you know, p points out this kind of thing as failure to generate those kind of things, you know? And I think about societies themselves, are they mm. successful? I mean, look at, Chinese society and their civilization with all their empires. They are allegedly the most stable on earth throughout history. They have maintained this and they have failed in so many ways. They have failed so many times and there has been this turmoil, but something about them made them resilient. You know, despite all this failure, they didn't fall. So failure and falling, failing and falling are not so intertwined are not so codependent it's actually it's almost like it, it shows it points this cycli cyclicity uh, mm -hmm. of things of how you kind of have to rise up you have to succeed and then you have to experience this depression and you have to rise again and it doesn't necessarily have to happen in a linear way for something to exist it has to like experience both birth and death you know, and they are kind of part of the life cycle itself. <clears throat> so I guess, you know, we are looking at failure from a very technical point of view with mm -hmm. designers and something functional, but actually failure, it's very embedded in our narratives. We need to fail in order to tell the difference. And I think that's important for us to develop complexity and a relationship to, to the complex world yeah. around us. But, yes. I mean, even given the, um, I mean, yeah, I totally agree with you. And, and in that direction, it's, we can say, like, even w with what I said before, like, we say society, from a society point of view, it, it is a failure. Not everyone in society agrees with that say statement, right? And we can look for something more recent in history, like, uh, 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 Musk acquisition of Twitter, right? And say for many people, it's a, it's a, it's a success from his point of view as well, probably. Uh, and from many other people, it's, 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 uh, it's not so, so good news, right? And can we categorize things in, you know, in that sense? I don't know. Well, it's hard to map this specific instance as a failure because we don't know yet. We need to see it fail. Like, you know, Nokia failing to like catch on with this opportunity is more... You could, say, you could say it's a failure from the board at Twitter to agree with this kind of... Or even for, for you know, the uh, American uh, system to, to accept that some, some something like that happens, you no. Know? Uh, yeah, it would be a you could say they... a very important thing like yeah. freedom of expression or having you know like Reddit. If Reddit were to be bought by Elon Musk or by Trump, mm -hmm. that would be the failure of free speech and you know this freedom of expression. And this is like again yeah. heightening a class revolution. I don't know. 
but it's uh... yeah it would have been someone else than Musk probably some people would be in the streets who knows but that's interesting you know to see uh, you know it's like uh, when you think about this like some rich really rich people have uh, you know their own uh, uh, newspapers and they can you know influence the narrative and therefore public opinion and it, you could say okay that's not that's not normal you know a priori it's not normal that's someone with so much power can so easily access to that kind of influence and for many other people it's like well that's that's normal right this is the the way things work so if they can buy a newspaper why 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 shouldn't intervene you know that's always like a defined <laughs> line like in you know in in France for instance we have some people like that and they are not so well perceived from for many from <laughs> from a large portion of the of the population uh but 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 I many guess others agree. Mark was saying about this who, at the expense of who you're failing. Like they are successful, and mm -hmm. you know the people who are taking the damage are very like removed from them. So that's actually you know it's almost like like an earthquake type of failure. You know there's an epicenter and there's a hypocenter. So you know at the the hypocenter it's felt quite little the damage is not that much but the epicenter kind of it blows away and it's, mm -hmm. it could be like a, at a very great distance so we could think of failure as something that it's yeah uh, i don't know i'm falling i'm failing to, to remember <laughs> the word it's like a really good really good word uh i don't know it was something like at a distance like remote i don't know it doesn't matter i lost it Mm -hmm. I yeah, I, I wondered if we were really going to be able to get through this chat without having to talk about Musk and Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, you know, no, no, I, it's, it's, I, I just haven't. Uh, I'm still thinking about it. Seriously, I'm trying to, trying to really, see. I think part of it for me on that specific thing is that he has a history of solving problems. True. Right. Right. And so some problem. <laughs> my, my, right, yeah, some problem, but or, or at least that's been his approach, right? To yes. apply first order thinking to certain problems. So my question is, what is the problem that he sees with Twitter? Right? And, yeah. And I think that's, that's something that I don't, I mean, I know what the possibilities are. Right? Well, but, but the fact that the new right are rejoicing is a clue to the fact that maybe we should be buying stock in ivermectin because, <laughs> because truth doesn't matter anymore and you know like, like so i don't i don't know exactly well, yet yeah I mean, but it is it is early days and you know you know I, i there's there are potentially very dark outcomes to this yes indeed so. yeah it's not clear i'm not saying uh, i personally i'm you know I'm feeling close to this uh, notion of uh, skepticism, so I don't want to put judgments. And but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to uh, ponder the, you know, some elements that we know in the past, and some elements that might happen. And I see, like, it's an interesting, you know, point in time right now. And yeah, you could say you could make some bets on where where he could go, and be totally wrong about it, you know, because, um, you know, this is also this, this thing that we, we tend to reduce everything to this one person and still he's not the, in the end, he won't be the only one. So you don't know really what, what will happen. I agree. And it's hard to make some, some judgment, but it's, I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, yeah, I feel an interesting thing that you know sometimes it's so it, it, it this kind of thing happens under the radar of of the, this kind of discussion and even for from the the public it's like they know they know about it like after the fact right mm. but it, it has been what is interesting it, it 
is the fact that it has been um, made so apparent, you know, and they they had some kind of intention of making it public, you know, beforehand, and all this story about him writing something for the public and doing some talk show to talk about his intentions behind. And I don't know, that's something like not so usual about this um, or has, acquisition. Has that, been, has, that been, has, he, has he said he's going to like make his intentions clear on national television or something? It was like, it, it, I hadn't heard that. Is that what he's saying? Uh, he, well, you know, whether it's television or whatever, but like, I mean, yeah, I well, mean, he was that invited was and it was a 1960s broadcast media kind of reference. Yeah, 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 true, true. On the radio. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> but the, he was, you know, he was uh, interviewed by um, this guy from uh, who created TED, um, TED Talks. Uh, I don't remember the name of the guy. And he was, uh, you know, celebrating the opening of the um, uh, Texas uh, Giga Factory. And you have this interview, it's one hour long and stuff like that. And he was discussing about many several things. But, you know, it, th there was some kind of, you know, um, it's interesting to note that it was made public that he will acquire, try to acquire uh, Twitter, but there, there was still some uncertainty. Like, it was set up as a story, you know, from the beginning, and it was... It was really timely in, in, in the moment it was um, published before this interview. And this interview, like, uh, allowed him to bring some of this, of the narrative within the, the discussion about this intention and the connection with all this idea of creating, like, a, a, a brighter future for humanity and stuff like that. You know, this kind of grand idea of, of the future that... Uh, Technocentric uh, future that uh, sometimes he, he he speak of and yeah it's interesting how it was how it is framed you know and how it is uh, it's like a, a show and I feel like it's interesting and and sometimes uh, I mean it's intentional that you you can see it's uh, it's it's storified in a way to. Mm -hmm. And, and I do feel like it's, it is interesting because one person that he's known for that kind of thing, like to create some kind of uh, story that is not really a story, like the, even the way that he, um, you know, he, he does events and he presents things. It feels like it's unprepared, but it is prepared. So, you know, this is, you don't really know what will happen, but you know that something will happen. You know, this kind of thing is good for that. And the, one one guy who is good for that as well is Trump, you know, and I do feel like it's really interesting to see how the the yeah how they they use media and stuff like that to to create this kind of narrative. But I think we drift from <laughs> a bit from the subject of failure, right? But uh, yeah, I feel like it, it, it is interesting to observe this kind of thing, and yeah, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's really not yet a, a failure. Now, <laughs> yeah, well, even if, when it is, you can turn things as a uh, as it's it's a uh, yeah. This is something we can speak about failure and how do you make success from failure? Like, you could you could clearly have um, a failure. I objectively, say, given the 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 objective that you 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 set up at the beginning. It's a failure, but turning that into a success, and it brings up the ethics of that, or the, you know, is it a good thing? Yeah, because from the what we discussed so far is like, is it a way to learn about what happened, to turn this failure in, into success? I'm just bringing up the question. I don't know if it's here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that there's likely a there are in in some decision making circles, there are 
I mean, there are many ways to split up decisions, but one way to think about it is reversible and irreversible, right? Decisions and that you, you approach reversible decisions differently than you approach irreversible decisions, right? Yes. And I think maybe there's something about that in failure as well, that there are certain types of failure that are catastrophic that you can't return to success from, but mm -hmm. there are minor failures that leave you standing you know, like that you haven't shipped all your chips into the middle of the table and gone all in from which there's no recovery. And so I think there's, I think first of all, so I guess the bottom line is you can't, not all failure is recoverable. Mm -hmm. Right. I think is, I think is one thing to kind of consider. And like I talked about before, the goal shouldn't be failure. The goal should be success. And if you don't succeed, is there some way to take lessons from that? Because that there are, that even in a failure, there might be partial successes. And can you marshal enough of those partial successes to, you know, redeploy whatever it is, your internal forces, whether that's like personal <laughs> internal fortitude or whether that's your team um, and, and take another kind of step forward, right? So I think, yeah. I mean, I think, I think you can, if you, especially in the situation where you are looking at options and you find an option that fails and you have two other options that now you have like a 50% chance from a 33% chance. Actually, it doesn't work that way. You actually have a better chance than that. Happens. But yeah, you know, that's kind of the way that you could think about it. Right, mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're narrowing down the options, and so you have a greater success of finding if 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 success is available overall. Right, is the other question, right? If the direction that you're going in actually does realistically have a chance for success, then maybe you've narrowed down the options. But if the direction you're going in is a lost cause, then all three options are wrong, and therefore you can't, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you you can't rescue that, so I would the answer. I guess this that's a long way of saying not always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you just said made me think of, you know, this idea of failure and success. They exist only if we agree with the fact that it's um you know the type of games that is called zero sum games. Yeah. Like that, there's necessarily some winners and some losers, right? So that given the situation that you could either, you know, succeed or, or fail. And then so there's no, nothing else, right? Um, so it brings a question, so should, should we accept that things are this way or should we look for something else, right? You you have to learn from failure because failure exists because success exists because the games tells you that there's some you know necessarily some winners and some losers right in the uh, in the game that we're all playing so yeah some some business fails and some business uh, succeed and so that brings the fact that it's type of game that allows a few to succeed. And a lot to <laughs> a lot of us to to lose, right? Yeah, but again, so you know, it, it goes back to you know which failures make you fall. You know, a business that fails to treat their employees nicely, or they're like they're failing in so many ways. You know, they have so many shortcomings, but they can still make profit, and that yes. keeps them afloat, and that kind of deletes the idea of failure around because they are looking at some metrics at some gains and they're like, oh no, we're not failing. But yeah, it's just what keeps you going, I guess. So some successes creates blindness over some failures. Yeah. In it's that also sense. like organ failure, you know, <laughs> when you have a, an organ failure, if it's your spleen, it's fine. You can live without it, but if it's but it your hurts, heart, you're done. You know, it hurts. You feel it, right? <laughs> exactly. You either feel it, and you know it's gonna hunt you for the rest of your life, but you can still live. 
but that's the weird the weird um thing with uh with companies is as as they are not like uh they are not really organisms you know <laughs> we we can compare them to organisms but they are not because there are no sensory real sensory inputs right so they can fail totally in some you know critical exactly. what, what are the triggers what actually are the uh how do you recognize it in this manner mm. let's say that these there are some specific feelings that are associated with failure one mm. with the fear of failure you know you have this anxiety in yourself but what is actually the feeling that you have when you're experiencing failure on a let's say on an emotional level because we we have all these different narratives and mm -hmm. you know it depends from one culture to another honor fail failure to like i don't know take care of your parents in these eastern societies or just not matching certain expectations this is much greater than any kind of failure but right? so i don't know mm -hmm. punished but what is the feeling associated with failure and why do we avoid it so much yeah well i think one word is here uh that uh, tells a lot is a fear right but is it a feeling or like more as, you know something that you can attribute to like a sentiment that you can attribute to many form of you know there are many yeah, forms of feeling it's just one response but like think about anger you can be angry about failure and most of these most of these companies when you an employee fails they will get angry not fearful mm. so we just have mm -hmm. really True. different feelings and responses and attitudes to failure from you know like a learning mindset to actually a very fixed one which is you have to live with the failure and you'll never overcome it mm -hmm. i mean I, i have no background in behavioral psychology but what you read sometimes is that you know that, that your that your emotions come from kind of a lineage of things that were you know more important and more critical in your past right where like failure to escape the predator mm. you know like like that's where the, the fear comes from the anticipation of the of that of, of not being able to escape right and so we, yeah. we carry some of that kind of with us right? yeah, but like, isn't that the fear from a successful survivor <laughs> But it's actually, we didn't think you the need, failure. You need it failed. ahead of time. Like, like there are, there is a part of this which is instinctive. I think that yeah. if you're only afraid after you've been mauled, that's um, career limiting. You know, mm. <laughs> in a way, right? Yes. To, like the the whole idea of this kind of this the kind of more instinctive approach to things is that it's anticipatory mm -hmm. right? that it allows you to avoid the the issue right the 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 fear and i think part of that too is anger in an organization or you know, if you think in the military the idea of drilling like literally what they you know drills like actually dr drilling mm -hmm. behavior into soldiers is done in a way that when the stakes are high the instincts will kick in yeah right and so that it is done in anticipation of the like in, in anticipation of success when it really matters yes right yes this is this idea of but well what one in what one thing that you said which is interesting is when you fear a predator for instance you you have a reaction to that fear mm -hmm. and this reactions brings action and this action is actually what transforms the fear into something else right so yeah. the the fear of this predator can you know uh brings you to act and try to kill the predator before it kills you or to run and this is two different kind of opposites yeah. Uh, results right uh, in both cases you can be killed and you, you know so it, this is what you anticipate is the that this you know this is a situation where you you can be killed uh, but you can have like two opposite um, reaction and so from the sentiment you have 
reaction and then action. And um, yes, and what you said is really interesting, but that means you 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 know like what the military is, is doing is that no, they knows already the kind of uh, behavior that saves life, that saves your life in, in a specific type of situation. And so they reinforce the, the reaction that you should have by doing a repetitive uh, thing over and over and over in a certain cir- cir- circumstances. So you know when, when, those, when you have these implicit sig- signals that this is the kind of situations uh, that you are in, then you can react to it in a, the proper way, the, the one that provides the more uh, chances of uh, survival, right? And so, but they have this uh, hindsight. They know what kind of behavior are most likely to save your life and those of your crew, right? Which is not always possible. And this is where this idea of learning from failure comes from. Is you know, if you reacted to something uh, and it it saved your life. Uh, the chances are really high that you will remember this uh, this type of reaction, and next time you are in a situation, in a similar situation, you will try to do the same thing in the best that you you can, right? And potentially it will increase your chance of survival because if each time it, it increases your chance of uh, you, you survive, that means you you are better at surviving than others that react in a different way. Well, essentially, you're learning from the failure of others. So you're not. So in a way, it's a different thing that you're thinking about, because one of the things that in that particular context is that there is an imagination at work that can foresee the kinds of circumstances that you might be in. Mm. Right. Based on. But that's and and it's, it's a good point, because I think what I was thinking about was failure within a project itself. Mm-hmm. But the idea of learning from failure of other projects, mm-hmm. and, you know, those who don't understand history are doomed to repeat it kind of thing that you, that we should think about failure. It, it, that's like, the, that's the importance of, of learning history, right? Mm-hmm. And that, and not history like capital H history, but the history of projects and the, you know, like that kind of thing, the history of other projects, the history of other things that have failed, other things that have been successful, more likely, I think, um, but, yeah, so that, that's that, that that's interesting. But yeah, the idea of yeah of, of anticipating the things that could go wrong so that you don't fail, right? Yeah, that, that's too. I think we could separate like learning at a, at a personal level and yeah. and learning as an organization. And yeah. typically, you can see it in the military. They do it from an organizational point of view because the trainee they don't really they are not necessarily aware right away of what this kind of training will bring them yeah right they they, they are just told to do to do so because because this is the way they do it right and they don't have really other options uh and it's part of the training so you but do it leaders, but the leaders are well educated in the history of yes that's true and that kind of thing too so i, I think that there is a you know and they also have a and one of the things that they've been talking about about the in the current conflict is that there are no non-commissioned officers in the Russian military, so they have no on-the-ground expertise mm-hmm. in decision-making, whereas mm-hmm. Western militaries are actually built that way, which means that even – that once you've, once you've got the instincts built into you, even if you are a, a non – like a – not an officer, yeah. you will start to learn the history and tactics and the – understand the why's like how to how to react how to read and react in a certain situation so i think you I, there's a there's a bleeding between the organization and the individual in terms of the knowledge yes well typically in the i, I know it at least for the french military that they do the training for you know the leader and the crew together so it mm-hmm. brings also this kind of relationship between people and trust that you couldn't have it otherwise. Mm-hmm. And so you create bounds, you know, be, beyond just uh, this idea of doing the training that you create something between individuals. It's clearly something that you couldn't 
do at, at scale in any organization, right? It's the military. So when you you join in, you you kind of um, agree de facto that you will give up some control about what you should do, right? So there's some kind of clear expectations that you will be told to do some things at some point that you just don't understand, but you, you have to do them, right? And and in in Japan, uh, in the Japanese culture, they have they have something similar, but it's clearly not uh, brought up in the same way. But this is the relationship between um, um, a trainee and the the sensei, and the sensei, the the role of the sensei, and this kind of learning curve that they have. That it it's uh, you should uh, you should do what the sensei t- tell you to do even if you don't understand it, because it's part of the learning process that you, you you are not aware of the usefulness of what is told to you until you do it, you know? You've, this you've, can- watched, you've watched The Karate Kid. No, 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 no. I don't, no, I, no, I didn't, no. Is that the four paint the fence, the car? No, 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 that's something, that's actually something I, I read on an article, sorry. You know? Yeah, it's- I'm more just kind of saying, like, that was, that, that's the that's the the Western cultural kind of equivalent of that learning is paint the fence, sand the floor, wax the car. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, it, it can end bad. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Diana. <laughs> no, I just like to, to build on what you said and what you're kind of talking about this trainee and the trainer and you know the experienced one and the learner. And yes. I think like there are two types of intelligence, at least when it comes to failure. One is to actually over just quickly adapt and, you know, assess situation based on the data points that you've been f- filled with, let's say. So it's more like the, let's say, system one kind of, you know, very quick response to failure. But then there's the, the other one, which is assessing the room for failure in a situation. And I think this mm-hmm. kind of requires a superior intelligence and a deeper understanding of what it means to fail. Because I feel like these leaders in the army, they're not just like considering absolute success. They're looking at these rooms where people can make mistakes and they can still overcome the situation. And I think this room for failure, it's, it's really important in how we devise business plans and things like this. And it shouldn't be made into a political tool, but at least, you know, strategic enough so... Mm. We are not uh, failing totally, you know. Just... You know that that's funny because it sounds like we are praising the the army for whatever <laughs> we are saying. Yeah, the but at the same comes time, from the army. Yeah, well, yes, true. But you know, there's something really weird that we are talking about project as in something like the military would do, and and weird and interesting. I would say weird in a sense, interesting. And you know what? In in Switzerland, most of the companies were mold uh, around, um, you know, this um, military aspect of it. And and so in really old companies in Switzerland, they, they have still the hierarchy. This is what remains from this era, you know. They have all the hierarchy, like with, uh, with the titles uh, that are f- coming from mi- military um, hierarchies, you know. And so that, this is what remains, <laughs> the structure and the hierarchy from the military, and not so much about this, <laughs> you know, aspects of, of the strategy, which is more like preparing for something that might not happen. But, you know, all this idea of uh, being able to sense the, 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 um, the landscape and react to it in a, in a proper you know, in the proper manner, in the sense that it increases your chance to, uh, of success regarding what you want to do in that circumstance. And so this is interesting because what remains from military in most places that I know of is usually the, the yaki, the structure, but not necessarily the doing, you know. <laughs> this is interesting. It's it's just like the hierarchy and structure without the effectiveness. Yeah. Like world, you yeah. know, the skeleton remains you know, long after the body dies. So yes. Yes. I mean, I, I think something else you mentioned there is, is interesting too. Is the is do you have like 
in, in this case, we're talking about organizationally. Mm. Right? And, and that could be of any kind of size, like, you know, 10 person project team or, or something like that. Are you attuned to the weak signals that if take if, if read properly indicate that something is going to fail? Right. Like if you look mm -hmm. in an engineering sense, they can go to a bridge and they can say, oh, look, there's been discoloration here, which means that this is under stress and we're going to fix this before it fails catastrophically. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's this this there's an equivalent notion of, you know, these these weak signals that indicate that something is going, you know, sideways because those things are easier to fix. Then it's easier to shore up the bridge than it is to rebuild it after it's been collapsed. Right. So I think part of yes. part of that is being is in a design project of any kind. Um, having a sense of when things are starting to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. Things like um, feedback is not coming as quickly as it used to happen. Um, yeah. People who are making decisions are becoming unavailable. Um, or people who are signing off on decisions, I should say. Uh, that there are um, people who were in meetings who are no longer in meetings that indicate that there's some kind of issue. Um, invoices that are being paid after six weeks instead of four weeks or two months out. Like there are, there are little things that you start to pick up on that, mm -hmm. that you need to be attuned to. And I think it's a, it's a matter of experience of kind of knowing that when you see these kind of discolorations in the beam or whatever that you do, yeah. that you, that you have, um, and there was a, a, an architecture firm years ago, actually I haven't followed their, their kind of progress. It was called UN studio. Um, and they came up with a really interesting notion of applying um, policies to design rather than rules, because mm -hmm. policies are kind of flexible. They're kind of like yes. Zen statements, right? And so the idea of having these anti-failure policies in the context of making something, I think, is a really interesting concept. Right? Yeah. If, if we notice that this is if we notice that this is happening, then we do this right oh this is similar to something we have a policy for we're going to treat it the same way yeah right and policies uh, can be um added they, exactly. they, they are extensible where where rules are can tend to be absolute you know that's right yeah and and, and rules are are applied are generally not flexible enough to handle nuance mm -hmm. in a way that policies are <laughs> right um so anyway, just to, to kind of circle back and think about success within projects, which, which I think is more given the, or at least what we're seeing, we are more likely to see teams that are assembled around projects than we see full-on organizations that are stable across projects. Mm -hmm. that, that, that the level of the, the level of kind of autonomous unit to make decisions and stuff, even if somebody who is, is signing off on it is working across projects, we find the project teams that that to be the unit at which success or failure kind of happens. Right. Um, yeah. so that's why I kind of think about it in terms of, in terms of teams also, also in terms of the fact that you, you will notice in teams, especially in the way that we work, that there are people who are assigned to the project. And you can often take a temperature on what the overall company thinks of the project by how much somebody is made available, for example, right? So that's another kind of flag. This person is, you know, this developer is now moved to halftime. Mm. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a red, red <laughs> flag kind of waving if that person's not being backfilled, right? For example. So anyway, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm thinking about this because I'm in the middle of reviewing an enormous contract where <laughs> we're trying to, <laughs> deal with you know ab absolving every party of or making sure that everybody's responsibility for success is clearly outlined what their role is going to be in a successful outcome mm. so, I'm carrying that baggage into this conversation <laughs> well, i guess at the, at the end of the day sometimes it's actually better to let things fail 
you know, in the short run at least, than to try and fix them endlessly to just do this patchwork, continuous thinking you can fix it to, to achieve success, actually letting go of it might be mm -hmm. useful. I mean, in a very capitalistic way around this, you get the warranty, you know, like two year warranty and after two years it dies. It like it's designed to work for that amount of time. <laughs> and after that it doesn't work anymore. It just mysteriously. But I guess it's it's hard. With people it's always hard because we have this complex understanding or misunderstanding of what failure is and we fail to understand our responsibilities. And I think that's one of the biggest issues on how hard it is to collide together and know work and mm -hmm. do something of value and i don't know a recipe to success in that context uh, well <clears throat> yeah i don't know if we yeah I, what you were talking about mark is the looking for the break in, in the patterns is something that uh, is, is clearly an interesting way to to look at weak signals now i i think you have to make yourself a uh, you know uh, allow yourself to listen to that kind of thing because uh, it, it requires, you know, to be in that kind of mindset that you you yeah you want to look for that kind of thing and you you want to listen to others as well because they might provide you with without being aware of of that of that fact they might provide you with this kind of you know um, uh, insights about something that is going on you know uh, and yeah I would say maybe we can we can yeah we can bring some principles around um, the same idea that what we were just discussed about the, the military that they focus on people and their relationship after that the training of those people that the way they they react to things in certain conditions and then after that, they, 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 they take care of the, you know, of having the, the proper uh, uh, tools for, for what, they, what they are doing. And so the tools are coming, you know, at the end, like first people, then their relationships, and then the, the, the tools. And, uh, and this is the way that perceive crews to be the most effective Uh so I think it's interesting because it, you know, you, you you see now that as you mentioned, Mark, that sometimes some teams are really good at at certain things and and have a track record of successful projects, uh, regardless of the overall successes of the company, right? So you could you could say like usually teams are not, you know, um, like they have uh, on on you know, I don't know, six projects, they, they fail on most of them and they succeed at one. And this this specific team is uh, successful on, on most of their projects. And, and you you know, by changing a bit the, 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 the team, you realize that it's not working anymore uh, because they, what they tend to do in organization, they see, oh, uh, this team is successful, so we will take those those guys and put them in other teams and they will bring the success <laughs> with, with them in other themes, and and it well, it, it rarely works that way, right? Yeah, but you get the, the the analogy from from military to sports. You know, you don't spread your best players across different teams. You just gotta put them all together because they're so fantastic in one. I mean, oh, but tactically, you might not do that. Yes. Yeah. That is well. a, that is a contextual. That's a contextual and, question entirely in terms of position. Yeah. That's a position question. Yeah. But but you have a good example that in at least in soccer, uh, football, soccer, football. I think it's it's called cool yeah, football. Football will work for the international. Yeah. Yeah. Players. Sorry. Every, everybody. Everybody else can adjust. Yes. <laughs> let's say, let's say it this way, and uh, and. Uh, you have the Real Madrid, which is a Spanish, uh, well-known Spanish team. They they put together like the what we could say the best people, the best footballers in on earth. It's a, and it's the Galacticos, right? Isn't that what? what they called it? Wasn't it called the Galacticos? Like the uh, best team in the galaxy? Was that them? Yeah, probably. I don't remember. Yeah. I'm not a, like a huge fan of <laughs> of uh, football. But I, I just know that they, they they still failed 
you know, <laughs> yeah. and 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 the fact is that uh, individually they were good at what they were doing, but they were not playing as a team, you know. And so this is where you you say, okay, you need the people, but they need then the relationship because otherwise you might have the best, you know, in in the project, the best developer, the best designer, whatever, and still fail because because they are not working in a way that you know provide this kind of the success. So there's, it, a, there's a flip side. There's a flip side to that though. First of all, a really good book if you want to read the flip side is called Brilliant Orange. Okay. And Brilliant Orange is about the Dutch football team and the total football strategy. Mm. Where everything was was in motion, and that that was the team with like Cruyff and, and, oh. and Brilliant Orange. It's a, it's a great it's a great book. It, it basically makes it, it ties Dutch culture to Dutch football and how it was playing. It's it's, it's it's a really brilliant thing. Um, but the other the other thing I was thinking too is there is this notion of taking people who are really effective at getting things done and promoting them to management, mm -hmm. right? Like out of teams too, which is also yeah. a, a wild misunderstanding again of roles in teams and how things, how things mm. work. Right. Mm. Um, anyway, sorry, I just want to say that. Sorry, Diana, you were going to say something. No, I was just going to say like, I, I didn't mean it like, you know, you get the best players and you put them together. No, you actually have a great team that kind of formed itself together mm -hmm. and then you split them apart. I think that's the wrong move. I, I mean, as wrong as you would be, bring the best ones together. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, you know, businesses are hoping that they can spread these good people, but actually it's the teamwork that and the relationship itself that you're, Kevin, pointing out that creates that experience and, you know, continuously creates this exchange and almost like a language that is perceived throughout the, yeah. the, yeah, the, the team. But again, you know, I think it's, it's again, it's an exchange of failures. You know, the fact that you can share your failures in that setting so you can learn from each other. Well, there's the flip side. Something I put very early on in this when we were building the island here was the notion of compounding failure, which is the inverse of what you oh, yes. yeah. <laughs> There's this notion that you make mistake after mistake after mistake and one mistake leads to another one and they tend to yeah. amplify as you, as you go on. So you're building on a rocky foundation. So I think there's... There's the flip side yeah. to the the resilience that comes from spreading out the chance of failure, which is the right. cascading kind of failures. And you can see that in sports too. Like one person gets a little bit deeper out of position, which creates a hole behind them, which creates another the requirement mm -hmm. for another person to leave their mark, you know, which creates space in behind them. And then all of a sudden, you know, three mistakes in a row leads to a goal going the other way, right? So it's this notion of, of, of one thing being out of, like a small a small error compounding into you know in football terms a catastrophic outcome yeah but you know this reminds me as well something well first can you share the link to the a link to the book or uh, at least yeah, the, yeah, the no, title no. of the book in the um, yeah. the I'll book channel right please Wait, i found that because I, I was looking for it and and uh, I, I would say, you know, you have also this kind of situation where, where a, a, an organization won't force the, you know, this kind of fake team culture that at least it, it is as toxic or not working in the end. And But with all this, this, you know, this kind of facade of, you know, good teamwork and happy family and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and, you know, the you cannot really like uh, operationalize this kind of uh uh the relationship of between people in the team you cannot you know it's not you have as, as well this kind of situation where where they do like um um personality personality um um test where they, they in the end the hr want to see who fits with whom and you know given certain criteria and this is at least to me this is the worst Thing, thing you can do is like um, make it make it it uh, artificial because you don't really know what makes the team what makes the team each member of the team you know bound together and it might it might be something not related to to work at all you you don't know and and you know so they they try to create this kind of a fake opportunities and yeah you can try to play the game that that is said but I don't feel like it's always it feels like forced and I don't know. It's not really open for 
the real kind of condition for 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 an actual you know at least uh, having good relationship with with the team but that's my feeling it's not always true but you know sometimes you feel like it's really forced and and fake <laughs> So are we going to end the conversation and then go to to our rooms? Like I'm already in my room in the dark and then talk about my own failures to myself. <laughs> like what is failure? Have I failed? Have I gained that compounding failure well, in my life? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and check on the, check on the team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, so we can end with the question. Did we fail to cover the term failure? <laughs> but did we did we actually outline what success would have been at the beginning? I think yes. and since we since we never do, it absolves us. It really keeps us from failure. <laughs> yes. Is that what okay. you mean by fail safe? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I guess it's one way to to cope with it. But I guess you know, for me, this failure and again in design is actually not seeing not having an impact it's not like i'm assessing the negative impact that much you know i'm mm -hmm. aware of it but i know that the kind of designs and the tools that i create don't create this negative friction into for people i don't see the, the black and white reality but seeing them fail would mean that they are not working that they're not producing any conversation or any they're not helping people generate the ideas that they might need or just you know invite them to the space of conversation so i think for me failure is the lack of a, a response at all it's this insensitivity failure to learn that's mine <laughs> so I'm, I'm overall satisfied with our little island here yeah <laughs> me too an island of failure <laughs> Yeah, and we failed to make it like, you know, centered. The failure is like, <laughs> it's, not, it's not aligned. It's, 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 yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good, isn't it? That's, that's... Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. <laughs> times. Thank you. Thanks all. Have a good day. Yeah. Take care. Mark, bye -bye. Have a good evening, Diana. <laughs>